Hey church, we're so excited to be with you this Sunday morning. We have a great message for you from Pastor Ben. It's gonna stir your faith, it's gonna bless you, and it's in season. Have fun, church. Hey guys, thank you for joining us at Avon Life Church. We're so glad that you can join us online. And if this is your first time checking us out, you can fill out one of our Connect and Engage cards with the link below. Hey Kids Life, we prepared something extra special for you and your family. So make sure you check it out with the link below. If you have praise reports or prayer requests, we would love to stand with you. As a church family, we continue to uphold each other and this community in prayer. So I encourage you, send your prayer requests through. Our giving is an act of trust and obedience that we choose to give to God with a cheerful heart. So be encouraged to put your trust in Him in your giving. Church, we are back together here online. Hope you had a great week. We've got a great word to go through. Um, before we get straight into it, let's pray. Let's give some time to God and let's enjoy ourselves. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together to share your word. Lord, we just pray as we watch this from our living rooms, from our offices or on our phones as we are on the go, Lord God, that you would speak to us. Our hearts and our minds are open and attentive to all that you have to say. Would we leave here? And would we go into the world change? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got what I think is one of my favorite sermons to share with you this morning. Uh, the title of my sermon today is called The Reach. Uh, and it's all about that reality that Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, as, as the triune Godhead, is an interactive God for us. That He is involved in our life. That He is in the seen and He is in the unseen. He's in the pain and he's in the joy that we can find him in all seasons and that he's a good God. Uh, we need to know, and one thing that I love to keep on the center of my mind, is that our God, Jesus, is alive. That he didn't just end when he died, but he rose again, resurrected. He's a living God and that he has all the attributes of a living God. And so when we say that the message today is about reaching, we're going to be talking about different aspects. We're going to talk about God's reach. We're going to talk about how sin has a reach in this world. And then we're going to talk about how we can reach towards the perfect God in Jesus. So, you guys ready to get started? Let's do this. There is something powerful, and I know we might not have thought about this in detail, about the idea of reaching. Like, like you get to reach for something. Uh, there's lots of different things that we interact with in the day-to-day -day that we reach for. Like when you pull uh, Woody's cable and the, the Toy Story character, he says, reach for the sky. My kids love that part of the movie. Or you've seen those challenges on the reality TV shows where they've got to stick their hand in a box and try to pull out the immunity idol, but it happens to be covered with spiders. And they have to get beyond the fear and reach into the box. We've all reached a milestone in our life, or we've all reached the end of a season in our life. We've all reached into things like dreams and hopes and visions and some of them we've succeeded in reaching into some of them we've failed but the concept of reaching is not foreign to us and even a child at a young age one of the early things they learn to do is reach for their parent and yet one of the first things we learn as we mature is to forget how we reach to god there is something absolutely beautiful and powerful with the act of reaching Let's just take a moment right now and I'm going to highlight a story that took place in the Old Testament that I just think really illustrates the concept of God's reach really well. In Isaiah 6, we pick up the story uh, of Isaiah having a vision and it says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings, two wings that covered their face, two wings that covered their feet, and the other two they were flying with, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. You need to know right now this vision that Isaiah the prophet has had is a powerful vision, but it also has a context that is set back before in the ancient times that we might not fully grasp what's taking place here. So let's take a moment to stop and look at that idea that the train of his robe filled the temple. We're not just talking about a nice, beautiful robe that's ornate and that makes him feel like he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're talking about a robe that is significant to his victory. Back in those days and in that time, what would happen is if one king battled another king, the victorious king would then take a parchment 
of the defeated king's robe. He would cut it off and he would attach it to his robe. And so as he won battle after battle, victory after victory, he would increase the length of his robe. So this imagery that we see here, that, that the train of his robe fills the temple, speaks to the unlimited victory that we have in Jesus Christ. We're talking about everything that God reaches into, and he can reach into all areas. There is nothing that stops him. There's nothing that can prohibit him. There's nothing that restricts his reach. He is sovereign, he is almighty, and he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. We need to understand this. God's reach is a reach that has no bounds, it has no limits, and we should find security knowing that where we're unable to do things, where we're unable to reach into the impossible in our own strength, it's because of God's reach, it's because of God's sovereignty that we have access to such reach. I want to take a moment right now to take a sidestep, and it's just a little tangent, and we're going to talk about another story that will help us better understand the significance of this particular illustration, and we're going to line it up with how sin has a reach in our life. We're going to talk about King David and before he's actually taken the throne, he's been appointed and anointed king by the prophet Samuel, but he hasn't yet taken his throne in Jerusalem and there is a battle going on at the moment. Saul is trying to hunt him down, who is the current king, and, and David has been given specific instructions that he is only to take the throne once God allows him to, that it would be in God's timing. 1 Samuel 24, we read that after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So he took 3,000 young men from all of Israel and he set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pen along the way. A cave was there and Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. The Bible tells us that David and his men were far back in the cave. Just imagine that picture right now. You're hiding for your life. You're in this cave. You've got your mates around you. And the guy that has been pursuing you nonstop, who wants to kill you, wanders into the cave by himself to relieve himself. David's men said, it said to him, This is the day that the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept unnoticed up to Saul and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. The Bible says that David was conscience stricken for having cut off the corner of Saul's robe. You've got to stop here in a moment and go, why is David so upset for cutting off just a little part of Saul's robe? Why is he upset if he'd listened to his men and he's taken the opportunity to show that he has the authority? Why is he so conscience stricken? And it's because David understands this concept of that you only took the corner of the robe if you were victorious. Now, that moment wasn't a moment of victory. That moment wasn't a moment for him to abuse the promise that God had given him. Yet Saul was in this place. Saul had no idea. And for all intents and purposes, it looked like this is what God had promised. The only problem was David was turning to the voice of his men for instruction, not to the voice of God. Isn't this just like us, however, when it comes to the things that God has promised us? To turn to all the different things in our life and make decisions without turning to God. See, that act of cutting off the part of the robe was really David saying, well, it's in my power, and it's in my timing, and it's in my authority that I inherit the promise of God. However, we all know that it's never in our own power, it's never in our timing, and it's never in our authority that we inherit the promises of God. We've got to be patient. We've got to be obedient. We've got to rely on faith. We've got to rely on the voice of God. But sin wants to deceive us. Sin wants us to believe that the promises are closer than they are or the fulfillment comes through our works and not the works of God. Sin wants us to be robbed of the promises by allowing us or convincing us to lean into our own strength and our own understandings. And see, this is why David is so upset. This is why he's so stricken, because he knows he's crossed a threshold, he's crossed a line, and he's allowed sin to reach too far into his life, and there'd be consequences from it. We've had a look at what God's reach looks like, the authority and the sovereignty, and that it knows no limit or no bound, that it operates in the realms of the impossible. And we've seen that sin is constantly prowling around, trying to reach into our lives and cause us pain and hurt and rejection and try to rob us of the promises of God. But we're going to take a moment right now, and we're going to look at this. And, and I've said this in my notes that 
that Jesus is perfect, that he's perfect, that in the moment where we're confused and in the moments where we're trying to figure out what we're meant to do or where we're lost in our hurts, our pains, our disappointments and failures, when we're lost in the confusion and the chaos of this world, to remember that he's perfect. And if we to reach for anything, let's reach towards his perfection. Let's fix our eyes onto him. I want to read you a story right now about the power of reaching that takes place in the New Testament. It's one of my favorite stories. It's extremely encouraging for all of us in any season in our life. But if you're listening in this uh, today and you're you're struggling with uh, where, where is God, where is Christ in my life, how can I interact with him, I've got all these needs, I've got, I need this miracle, I need the impossible to turn up, well, I hope that this story in the Gospel of Luke will encourage you. We're going to pick it up in Luke 8, reading from verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. I love that imagery that they'd all been waiting for the rabbi to turn up, the miracle worker, the way maker, and he arrives. And the Bible says that this man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. That picture is an incredible picture that Jesus has been welcomed back. They're all loving on him. And this man comes in desperation and he lays at the feet of Jesus because his daughter, if you've ever had a child or if you've ever had something so valuable that you could be losing, just that act of surrender when you know that it's not in your control and you just come just like Jairus did and just go, Jesus, I need you right now. The Bible says that Jesus out of compassion went with him and he was surrounded by the crowds. And on the way to Jairus' house, this woman in the crowd had been suffering for 12 years with constant bleeding and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, the Bible tells us that she reaches out and she touches the fringe of his robe and immediately after touching the robe of Jesus, the bleeding stopped. And Jesus says this, he says, who touched me? And everyone denied it. And Peter said, master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. As to say, how would we know there's so many people touching you? But Jesus said, no, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and she fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been healed immediately. Jesus says this, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Wow. What an amazing story. What an amazing story that we get to read thousands of years after it took place. This woman, I need you to understand right now, Bible says for 12 years she has suffered from constant bleeding. And so socially she was not allowed to be amongst that crowd. And if she was amongst that crowd, she would have had to tell everyone wherever she went, hey, I'm unclean, stay clear from me, stay away from me, you're not allowed around me, I'm not socially accepted. The Bible says that she had found no cure, which tells us that she had probably spent a lot of time, money and resource trying to find the help that she needed, yet though she had looked everywhere, she'd still not found the cure. The Bible then also gives us clear insight that her own self, her own self-worth, how she identified herself would have been pretty crippled. That she would come from behind Jesus, that she wouldn't feel like she could speak to him like Jairus, the leader from the synagogue, could speak to him. She felt that she had to creep from behind because this is the identity she had been living in for the last 12 years. But something miraculous happens. The Bible says that as she touches his robe, she finds a miracle. As she reaches out for Jesus, she finds a miracle. And I can't help it but look at that imagery and be excited that all we need to do is reach out for Jesus, even in the most impossible situations. I know some of you listening online right now need to be encouraged to push past the labels people have given you, the failures that you've had to endure 
the lost or rejection that you've had to live with. I need you right now to begin to focus your hopes, focus your vision, focus your faith onto Jesus because this promise of healing, this promise of the impossible is for you. It's for your circumstance. It's for your family. It's for your marriage. It's for your school. It's for your workplace. It's for your relationships. It's for your finances. God knows no limit or bounds in regards to the reach of his impossible nature. All of us have labels. All of us have allowed ourselves at some point to be found being identified by the wrong things. But the best thing about Jesus is not only does he want to heal us, not only does he want to work the miracles in our life, not only does he want to be the provider in our lives, he also wants to restore a new identity to us. What has prohibited you from reaching out to the miracle worker? the way maker. Can I encourage you right now? Begin to allow your faith to be stirred. I'm not sure exactly what's going on in your life. I'm not sure what that what afflicts you or what your journey looks like right now. What I do know that with Jesus, your future is filled with hope. With Jesus, your future is filled with purpose and there's a destiny there, not a plan defined by your mistakes, but a plan defined by the king of heaven and earth. I'm going to tell you a story right now about when my wife and I met and uh, there was this story that took place. It was an odd occurrence, but it, it sort of gives you an insight, one, to how I think and what I enjoy in life, but also how our God operates and just the power he brings into our life. When we were engaged, we would travel to different garage sales and op shops and I was constantly in the, in the lookout for, on the lookout for just glass beer mugs like Stein mugs and... Uh, one time we went to this particular garage sale and I picked up one and I really loved it. It was like the most favorite. I spent $2 on it. Uh, but the value of what I paid for what it was worth to me and how I just liked how it looked and the craftsmanship was two different things. It was my favorite thing we bought that day. And we came back home to where I was staying with my brother in his house. And uh, my brother's house at the time had this beautiful brick wall down the middle of the living room. Uh, it was a feature wall and the couch was up against it and I remember putting our, my mug on the couch and then it was wrapped up, it was taken care of, it was, it was beautifully protected and, and unwrapping that to have a look at it, to have a glimpse at it and while I was doing that, Emma's like, are you excited about your mug? Do you love your mug? And I was like, I love it, I'm so excited and I pick it out of the, the package and I'm like, this is my mug and I, and I stretch my arms open wide and I smash the mug straight into the brick wall and I just remember just like there was this feeling inside something had just taken place that I couldn't fix like it wasn't like a little chip like this mug exploded and and you know my loving fiance at the time Emma just burst out laughing and she said your face was priceless and I computed that with my broken hurt let down face made her laugh but I look at that and, and I, what I did was I collected all the glass pieces. This is true hope for you. I collected all the glass pieces and I put them in a shoe box. And I had this thought that one day I'm going to come into contact with someone who knows how to work with glass and they'll be able to repair what is my favorite mug. And I stored that glass mug away. And I find it interesting that in our life, if we were to reflect on that story that how many of us have had dreams or had goals or visions that were the best thing in our life? It took our attention. It had our affection. We were in love with it. It's what it was gave, it gave us drive. It gave us passion. It gave us momentum in life. But for whatever reason, it broke or it was shattered or we failed and we didn't reach it. We didn't achieve it. And we, we pack it away and we put it in a box. Hopefully one day it will come back to life and we put it on a shelf and we forget about it. And we, we stop reaching for it. We stop believing in it. We stop seeing purpose and meaning in it. But right now, today, I want to tell you that if in my broken situation where I had a broken glass, if I take that broken glass to a glass worker or a glass maker, he or she could fix it. And yes, it would be clearly still broken, but rebuilt it would still be beautiful to me if in many ways even more beautiful now so the question for you is if you're to reach into that box of broken dreams what happens if you take that broken dream 
and you bring it to the one that can rebuild it, the one that works with dreams, the one that can repair vision, restores sight to the blind, the one that can allow your crippled dreams to be restored to full health. What if I was to tell you if you were to simply reach for the perfect one, that he would begin to work in those broken parts of your life and begin to make beauty out of ashes. That's what we're talking about this morning, the power to reach. God has unlimited reach. And because of sin, our ability to reach out to him was prohibited. But because of Jesus, because he stepped down from heaven and gave his life, and because he lived a perfect, unblemished life, because he went to the cross as a perfect sacrifice and rose again, conquered the grave and was victorious over death, because of him, we now have the ability to reach, reach for that robe that signifies that our God has no limit to victory, that that robe that fills the temple in heaven with glory is the same robe we have access to here and now, and its name is Jesus. What if I was to tell you right now that the brokenness in your marriage can be repaired, that the brokenness in your finances can be repaired, that the relationship that you might have, which is strained with a, a, a daughter or a son or maybe a close friend can be mended in the name of Jesus? What if I was to tell you that the illness in your body right now in the name of Jesus could be healed? What if I was to tell you right now that all your hopes when placed into Jesus are protected, are safe, and will endure. What are you doing today to reach? Are you running? Are you hiding in the crowd, feeling like you're not eligible? Or maybe you're too prideful. Maybe you think you don't need Jesus. Maybe you're too afraid to put your hope into something again out of the fear of being let down. Jesus will never let you down. Jesus is for you and not against you. The Bible says that before he ascended into heaven that he would ask the Father to send another helper to be with us and that was the Holy Spirit. And because of Jesus, we now have not just God with us, but God inside us. And we get to activate all authority in heaven and earth with that name that's above every other name, the name of Jesus. You need to know that it's the same robe, it's the same power, but most importantly, it's the same love. Though we may see our problems in terms of big or small, Jesus simply sees them as defeated. Church today, would you be bold like the woman that had bleeding? Would you see past everything that wants to stop you, to rob you, and would you reach out to Jesus in every scenario of your life? Church, I pray that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Whatever you are up to, be blessed. Walk in that authority. Carry that hope. Hey, church, we hope that you enjoyed this message and that it inspired you to reach for Jesus in every area of your life. I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much that if we reach to you, Lord, that you're faithful to take our hand and guide us like a good father. Lord, I pray that you would fulfill every need that we desire, God, as we lift up our prayers and petitions to you, that we'd reach for you, and God, you being so close, our ever-present help, that your love would be our comfort and our strength. We pray this in the unshakable name of Jesus. Amen. We love you, church. We hope that you have a great week.